The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, President of the Democratic Republic of Timor Leste. I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the Excellency, I wish to, uh, uh, I, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, President of the Democratic Republic of Timor Leste, and to invite him uh, to address the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President. It's an honor uh, to return to this Assembly of Nations once again as President of my country, for which I was re-elected five months ago. I, uh, I'm conscious of time, so I, I have distributed, we have distributed my full speech, and I will skip over uh, many uh, pages for the, for as courtesy respect uh, to this assembly. Like almost every country on the planet, Timor-Leste endure multiple climate change catastrophes, prolonged dry season, followed by floods, the COVID-19 pandemic, and now the global economic impact of Russia-Ukraine-NATO confrontation. We had minimal direct impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of hospitalizations and fatalities. More children died of dengue than COVID-19. But the policies we undertook to prevent the spread of this insidious virus, such as curtailing free movement of people and goods, inevitably impacted on the livelihood of rural and urban people across the country. Farmers and traders suffered the most. To protect our children, we closed down schools, even though we knew that this decision would have serious detrimental consequences for the hundreds of thousands of our children and youth who had to miss school and miss out on the one meal a day program, which provides a meal for every child in schools across the country. In the very early days of the onset of the pandemic, our health authorities and WHO and other UN agencies on the ground scramble, work hard day and night to prevent the much feared virus from killing our people. Thanks to the prompt actions taken by the government, supported by our partners and friends, we avoided a public health crisis. Australia proved to be a true sisterly neighbor, promptly delivering every assistance our fragile health system required. We are deeply grateful for the speedy, generous action taken by the Australian government in deploying medical specialists, ventilators, and intubation equipment, training local staff. When, it, when a vaccine became available, Australia provided us beyond our needs, enabling the vaccination of more than 72% of our people, including children, in record time. Government and civil servants who at times move at a tropical leisurely pace quickly drafted a COVID prevention economic and economic recovery strategy, which included cash transfers and food baskets for every low income household. We are grateful to COVAX for the initial shipments of vaccines. We are grateful to New Zealand, Republic of Korea, Japan, China, the European Union, Portugal, and the US for their general support in kind and Cash. In a world plague with conflicts and man-made catastrophes from Myanmar to Afghanistan to Yemen to Ukraine, Timor-Leste is an oasis of tranquility. Common criminality is very low. Armed robbery is unheard of. We do not have organized crime. Our Catholic majority population, 98%, and the Protestant and Muslim brothers and sisters communities live side by side in total harmony. Timor-Leste does not have a single case of ethnic or religious-based tension and conflict. In 2023, Timor-Leste will hopefully gain WTO accession. Another natural extension of our country's regional and 
global economic integration. ASEAN and WTO accessions are driven by the more or less own economic interests, such as domestic economic reform process, to ensure healthy, enabling environment for FDIs and national, national investment and diversification of our economy. ASEAN membership is a strategic imperative, as important as Timor-Leste stability and prosperity, as much as peace and prosperity in Timor-Leste should matter to ASEAN. As much as peace and prosperity in our neighborhood benefits all conflicts or threats of and risk originate in one country inevitably impact on others. At Independence 20 years ago, we had only 20 medical doctors. Today, we have more than 1,200 doctors for a population of 1.5 million. These would not have been realized without Cuban solidarity. At Independence 20 years ago, life expectancy was less than 60. Now, a Timorese woman can expect to live beyond 71 years of age. Connectivity will surge in the next three, four years as Timor-Leste will be linked by several submarine cables to Australia, Indonesia, and beyond. As it is, we already have a high percentage of mobile and social media users, and, and we are experimenting in the exciting digital and e-government. Excellencies, I wish to, now to touch upon three matters of profound concern. The extremely serious food crisis affecting millions of people in Africa and Asia, this one issue. I hope that all have read carefully the letter of our esteemed Secretary General dated 13 August 2022 addressed to all heads of state, which provides with clinical precision exact figures on the number of our fellow human beings, women and children, youth and elderly in several African countries in Yemen and Afghanistan. The World Bank Food Commodity Price Index, which reached a record high in in norm, nominal terms during March, April 2022, went up by 15% between April and May 2022, and is more than 80% higher than two years ago. Add to this the recent devastating floods in Pakistan, inflicting heartbreaking suffering on over 30 million people. Aid to poorer countries of the South should not be canceled out to be reallocated to address the refugee crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. In 2015, donor countries reallocated their ODA commitments to the North African, Syrian, Afghan, and Iraqi refugee crisis flowing into Europe, causing an estimated 15% drop in total aid. The potential for a diversion of aid now is even greater after $345 billion were estimated as needed for the reconstruction of Ukraine. We must ensure that the Ukrainians are supported, but do not, but not at the expense of unity with the many struggling people in other nations. In the aftermath of the 2008-2009 subprime crisis, which had knock-on effect across the globe, hundreds of billions of dollars were quickly mobilized to rescue exposed European and American banks. Draconian fiscal austerity measures in the forms of cuts in public expenditure and higher taxes were forced upon the workers and middle class in the crisis-affected Western countries. But rarely we are, we are we able to inspire the rich to show the same level of compassion and wisdom towards the poorer South. I always believe that we are part of the great human family, yet some seem to feel that we are not really equal. We are not part of the same human family, since part of the world lives in dazzling citadels while their billions of distant relatives live in poor global neighborhoods. The Western countries and others it started off on high moral ground in confronting Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but may end up losing the support of the developing world, which, after all, are 80 percent of the global population. They should pause for a moment to reflect on the glaring contrast in their response to the wars elsewhere, where women and children have died by the thousands from wars and starvation. The response to our beloved Secretary General's cries for help in these situations have not met with equal compassion. And we, are we, 
we are now faced with a ruinous situations in terms of the rising cost of living for the poor. This has already resulted in riots in Sri Lanka, Peru, Kenya, and most recently in Haiti. Low-income countries were able to spend only a fraction of the amount spent by the high-income countries on COVID-19 stimulus packages. 20% of GDP for high-income countries, 6% for middle-income, and 2.5% for low-income. As a result, many countries had to increase their debt. Debt levels now limit us in protecting the weakest and most vulnerable from the effects of rising prices, let alone allow us to increase our efforts to address the climate emergency, which threatens our very existence. The number of developing countries in debt distress or at high risk has doubled since 2015 to 60%. But equally, I want to address our cries for solidarity and fraternity to the billionaires and the trillionaires of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. There is more liquidity in Asia than in Europe and the USA combined. It is time for the richest families and corporations of the so-called Global South to gather in a historic summit hosted by our STEAM Secretary General to commit themselves to a vision and plan of action to rid Asia, African Latin America of extreme poverty, child malnutrition, provide clean water and sanitation to every poor community, vaccines, basic public health, better education facilities, and better housing with renewable energy and connectivity for better access to education and business. This can be done by, rich, by the rich of the global south. All it requires is vision, great hearts, audacity and understanding that investing on the poor of our own countries, we're investing in peace. Lastly, I want to speak, talk about situation in Myanmar. The people of Myanmar feel abandoned, betrayed by the so-called international community. They ask why the difference in treatment, prompt and extremely generous support for Ukrainian civilians and refugees, so much sophisticated military support for Ukraine resistance, and such a mute reaction to the war waged against the people of Myanmar. The Myanmar conflict is impacting the security and stability of neighboring countries. It may escalate. There has to be dialogue by all involved in the conflicts in Ukraine and Myanmar, and in other crises around the world. The Tatmado cannot claim it is defending itself from external aggression. In the Ukraine conflict, Russia and Ukraine should clear the ports and sea routes and allow normal resumption of permitted international shipping activities, following on the breakthrough in the grain and fertilizer agreements brokered by the Secretary General. As there are an extremely limited number of credible neutral global leaders, the UN Secretary General and high envoys of his choice should work hard day and night to reach a humanitarian ceasefire agreement and a provisional peace agreement. The ultimate goal will have to be a comprehensive permanent peace agreement what it should be aimed now is a temporary cessation of troop movements, military action, humanitarian air and land corridors, and zones for unimpeded humanitarian assistance and resumption of ex export and import activities. Russia, Ukraine, and NATO countries have to swallow their pride, review their past policies that led to this mutual suicide, back away from each other borders, let Ukrainians rebuild their lives, their country and lives, let Russians retreat with security to their borders. I thank you, Your Excellency. On behalf of the um, uh, Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste for the statement just made. And I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Paul Henry Sandaogo Dafmiba, President